Romans, the 14th chapter, beginning at verse 16, reading through verse 23. The King James text today reads in this fashion, Let not then your good be evil spoken of, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. For meat destroy not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. It is good neither to eat flesh nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth or is offended or is made weak. Now listen to verse 22. Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. I want to talk to us today on the topic, keep it to yourself. <laughs> I guarantee you this is not a message you'll hear in most evangelical or fundamentalist churches today. But I also promise you it is the truth of God. Amen. Let's go to the Lord one more time. Father, once again, Lord, we love you. We thank you for the opportunity to be in the house of God. We thank you, Lord, for the songs of Zion which lift our hearts and encourage us and remind us, Lord, there is a day coming when we shall be presented unto you as a glorious church without spot or wrinkle having been washed in the blood of the Lamb. Master, the Word of God is so important to our spiritual progress. It is so important to our maturity and our growth and our moving forward in You. And it is imperative that the anointing of the Holy Ghost, the touch of God, the seal of approval from heaven, rest upon every word that is spoken, if that word be true. Lord, I ask today that you would quicken my spirit to preach the message you've given me to preach, that you would touch my lips, allow me to speak that which needs to be spoken, and to remain silent, Lord, in those matters where silence is required. Touch the ear of every hearer, Allow, O oh God, today the truth of God to accomplish that for which it is said. Save, deliver, heal, reclaim the backslider today, O oh God. For we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name. Amen. Praise amen. God and amen. I'm going to say some things today as I've said <clears throat> that I'm quite certain you have never heard before and probably would never hear in or coming from most fundamentalist or evangelical pulpits. Excuse me one moment. My allergies have been beating me up the last couple of weeks with all the winds we've had. <clears throat> But although much of what I may say today you may never have heard before, I guarantee you if you'll weigh it, you'll find it to be the Word of God and you'll find it to be truth. The Christian faith was never meant to be an aggressive religion 
that forced itself upon the unbeliever. Nor was it meant to be a singular minded religion without room for those with differing opinions or differing understandings within its own number. From the beginning, the Apostle Paul made it clear that each believer was responsible for themselves and themselves only. We are called to live our faith peaceably and quietly, without argument, without debate, without being pushy. The bond that binds God's people today is our faith in the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. In the first part of Romans chapter 14, we read today verses 16 through 23. But in the first 15 verses, the Apostle Paul makes it abundantly clear that there is room in the church for people who differ in opinion or differ in understanding or even who differ in their level of maturity in the faith. In Romans 14, 1 through 15, Paul writes, Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth despiseth him that eateth not, and let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth, yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand." One man esteemeth one day above another. Another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord. And he that regardeth not the day to the Lord he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not, to the Lord he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord, and whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Let us not therefore judge one another any more, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus, listen carefully, that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably. Destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ 
died. From the earliest days of the Christian faith, the main issue which has existed causing division and strife has been that of the law of Moses. Many want to make matters of the law part and parcel of the gospel message. The message of grace was too hard even in the first century for many, particularly those who had converted from Judaism. How could God possibly go from one testament in which he required a litany of works and rules and edicts to a message in the New Testament of grace and faith, which requires only that we believe upon Jesus Christ and walk in relationship with Him by reason of the Holy Ghost in our lives. Many failed and still fail to this day to understand that the law was a teacher meant to help us understand for a fact that true holiness and absolute righteousness were beyond the reach of mere mortal men. But sadly, where there are rules and laws, there will always be those who convince themselves that they are capable of following and obeying every one of them. Mm -hmm. They can't. But they will happily convince themselves otherwise. Ignoring their own shortcomings and sin, they will look only upon that which they do and ignore those things which they fail to do. Mm -hmm. Although it is also required. <laughs> 1 Peter 3, 15 through 17, the Word of God declares, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you, with meekness and fear, having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation or your good behavior in Christ. For it is better if the will of God be so that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. Serving the Lord is supposed to be a matter between the child of God and the God of the church. Mm -hmm. Our own conscience is meant to serve as our guide. Did you hear me, children? I said our own conscience is meant to be our guide. Oh, there are going to be some people that are going to choke on their teeth at that. Oh, no! The Holy Ghost is there to convict you of sin. The Bible never says anywhere that the Holy Ghost is present to convict anyone of anything. That is one of the old Pentecostal fairy tales. And oh, I'm going to get a lot of trouble for saying that. That's one of the old crap holes that we've been preaching for decades. That's a bunch of garbage. That the Spirit of the Lord runs around knocking you on the head and beating you up and making you feel bad for doing something you know you shouldn't do. It's not the Holy Ghost, you knucklehead. It is your conscience. Conviction is born in the heart of man. It does not come from the Spirit of God. God does not place a conviction in you. You develop and you establish conviction, listen to me, conviction based upon that of which you have become convinced. Convince and conviction are coming from the same base. 
When you become convinced, absolutely 100% convinced of something, then you are going to hold that as a conviction. Mm -hmm. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? There are people in this country who hold some of the most idiotic and asinine, stupid convictions that I've ever heard of in my life. But they genuinely feel it as a conviction. And it is a conviction for them. Why? Because they have become utterly and totally convinced that this is so and this is what it is. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Mm -hmm. But in our primary text today in uh, Romans 14, the apostle makes it abundantly clear that even our good conduct as children of God can be evil spoken of. Mm -hmm. The kingdom of God, he said, is not meat and drink. He's talking about the law. He's talking about rules and regulations. He is not here talking merely about dietary law. He is using dietary law as a springboard or as an example of matters of the law. He said, what is the kingdom of God comprised of? It's not meat and drink. It's not rules and regulations, but righteousness. What is righteousness? Doing right. Every single child of God ought to be striving to do right in their lives. You strive to do right by God. You strive to do right by the church. You strive to do right by your neighbor. You strive to do right by your employer. How many people live their lives and they honestly have that conviction. I'm going to try my best to do right by my employer. I'm not going to sneak off and take breaks that shouldn't be taken. I'm not going to do... I used to work with a guy. I, I did delivery for a while for uh, AutoZone where I drove a little pickup and I'd go to various uh, uh, shops and, you know, uh, deliver auto parts to different uh, mechanics and what have you. And there was one guy who did the same job I did. He was a little bit older, a fella. And that man, every single day, would come to work. And he would then proceed to lose himself in the warehouse area of the store. He'd wander around back there and just lose himself. You know why? Because every time a new order come in that needed to be delivered, he was nowhere to be found. And the other guys, including myself, who did deliveries, we wound up picking the work up and we wound up having to make the deliveries and do it. This fellow did virtually nothing all day. Literally. And oh, he used to drive me up the wall. They're not paying you to stand around in the warehouse. That's not what you're being paid for. And obviously, righteousness is not high on your priorities. Am I telling the truth? No. When I go to work, I'm there to work. I'm there to earn my pay, to do right by my employer. I don't commit adultery because I'm trying to live a righteous life and I'm not going to do wrong by my partner. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Husbands, you don't commit adultery because righteousness demands that you do right by your spouse. And wives, don't you go rushing off to the kitchen to get a cup of coffee because you know this is coming, but the same is true for you. It's not about, you know, so many preachers think that the model for a Christian preacher is authoritarianism. I hate to say it, but I grew up in church, and I, in my early ministry, I had that mindset too, you know. It was like, well, bless God, we preachers are supposed to be the supreme authority, glory to God in the church, and you know, what I say is given by God, and that's how we're supposed to live it, and we're supposed to live it because God said to live it. No. No. The kingdom of God is not meat and drink. It's not rules and regulations. 
It's not laws and edicts. It's not commandments and demands. It is righteousness. Well, that, in one word, sums up an awful lot, doesn't it? Simply means, as a child of God, we are motivated as a child of God to do right. I'm going to do right by my spouse. I'm going to do right by my employer. I'm going to do right by my neighbor. I'm going to do right by the guy I'm driving on the highway with. Hello now. I don't know how many times I get aggravated. I'll tell you what, Tommy and I, Tommy and I both, I guess you hit a certain age, you just start losing it with all these knuckleheads on the highways and byways. Man, I've never seen a time in human history when people drove as nuts as they drive today. I drove Uber for three years. I was driving Uber. And my goodness have mercy, I saw people pulling stuff on roads. I just could not believe. You know, you put on your blinker to change lanes and all of a sudden this character in that lane decides he's going to speed up because God forbid... You get in front of him. Why? What on earth difference does it make? <laughs> what? As long as y'all are headed in the right direction, as long as y'all keep moving, what on earth difference? The highway is not the Indy 500. It's not a race. You know, you're not going to win nothing for getting home one one thousandth of a second before the other guy does. What's wrong with people in our world today? No, fool me. I believe the kingdom of God is righteousness. I believe as a Christian, I'm supposed to try to do right by people, don't I, Booby? And if I see somebody's blinker going, what do I do? I slow down a little bit or I speed up a little bit. I do what I need to do to give them room. If I'm coming up on an entrance ramp and I know people on that entrance ramp are going to need to move over to get on the highway, I'm not a fool. I'm not going to stand there in that lane and ride right alongside of them and cause them to have to take the next exit ramp all because I'm too lazy to change lanes. There are so many things that I do every day that are brought about by good old-fashioned courtesy. Mm -hmm. Do you know what courtesy is? Courtesy is righteousness. It's trying to do right by people, right? Right. You get out of their way so they can move through. You do what you got to do to accommodate the next person. That's righteousness. I want to tell you something. We got Christians running around blowing trumpets and carrying signs. I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. And yet they don't act right. It don't matter what situation they're in. It don't matter where they are. They drive like lunatics. They act like lunatics in the store. Hello now. They mistreat their spouses. They mistreat their children. They act like authoritarian leaders' dads rather than as loving, caring fathers. Their children know them as the lawgiver, not as the lover. Oh my goodness, did you hear what I said? The Bible doesn't say fathers demand of your children excellence and perfection. That's not what the Word of God said. No, my Bible says, fathers, love your children. Isn't that what he said? Yeah. But isn't it funny how Christians, so-called Christian parents, don't even know how to love their own kids. The Lord didn't ask you to love the neighbor's kids. He asked you to love your kids. And they don't even know how to love their own kids. Fathers don't know how to demonstrate love to their own children. And yet, listen to me, that is the right thing to do. Don't you stand there, fool, and tell me your holiness. Don't you stand there and tell me that you're holy before God when all your child sees in you is a demanding figure who hands down laws and edicts. And you're not doing right by your children. Demonstrating to them 
the unconditional love of God. Because I'm going to tell you something. When a parent mistreats a child, that child without fail will translate the treatment of the parent to God. Mm -hmm. However you treat your children, see, you're supposed to be a model. You're supposed to demonstrate the attributes of God to your wife, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. What does that tell you? You're supposed to demonstrate God. You're supposed to demonstrate the Lord to your spouse. Am I telling the truth? You're supposed to demonstrate the Lord to your children. You're supposed to demonstrate the Lord to your neighbor, to your friends, to your family to your community, to your world. How do you do that? It's simple. The kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness. I'm going to tell you something. We'd win more people to Jesus. The churches would be more full than they've ever been, and they'd be full of a whole lot better a quality of people if God's people focused on righteousness, doing right, mm -hmm, yes. than they did on meat and drink. Yes. And peace. Oh my Lord, I know more Christians who will be the first ones to dive into war and battle and debate. They'll be the first ones who want to argue with you and fight with you over every little thing, over every little issue. Word of God said, follow peace with all men and holiness. What is holiness? Righteousness. Without which no man shall see the Lord. What else is the kingdom of God? It is joy in the Holy Ghost. I'm going to tell you something. When you do this thing right, <laughs> you're going to have joy in your life. You'll be happy when things aren't very happy. You'll feel good when things aren't going real good. You will feel a satisfaction and a peace and a joy in your heart when there is calamity and disaster all around you. If you do this thing right. Problem is, we've got people today in the church who are lacking the joy in the Holy Ghost because they're not doing the other two things. Mm. They're not pursuing righteousness. They're not pursuing peace. Paul then goes on to talk about that he said, let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. Oh no, we got Christians today. They're not, they're not looking for things that are going to keep the peace. They're not looking for things that are going to avoid argument and debate. No, no, no. They're looking for the things that are going to cause the debate and the argument. They're looking for every opportunity they can to start a debate and start an argument. Oh, I'm standing up for righteousness. Glory to God. Well, I got news for you, stupid. You're doing it in entirely the wrong way. Yep. Because standing up for righteousness would mean that you approach the matter in such a manner as to keep the peace. They want me to bake a cake for their gay wedding. Okay, no problem. I'll bake the cake. They've asked me to bake the cake. They didn't ask me to be in a three-way on their honeymoon. They didn't ask me to perform the ceremony. They asked me to bake a cake. I'm in the business of baking cakes. Only God knows what half the cakes I bake are used for. Hello now. No, we do those things which keep the peace. You avoid creating conflict. You avoid. That's why the Word of God said, agree with your adversary quickly. Lest he take you before the judge. We got Christians, these fools will stand there. I'm standing up for God. Next thing you know, they've been dragged into the courtroom, the secular courtroom. I'm standing up for God. Ellie, really, you're not doing it right. Word of God said, agree with your adversary quickly. Let's take take you before the judge. And let me tell you what else the Word of God said. The Word of God says, and you lose. 
Mm -hmm. So don't stand there like a fool and think that, oh, I'm standing up for right. God's going to make me win in court. The Lord's going to make me win in court. Ask that fool woman who wouldn't issue marriage licenses to gay couples. I work in the clerk's office. I don't believe me. I'm not going to do it. They drag her to court. Did she win? No, she didn't win because the law of the land says differently. You see, we've got Christians, Tommy, today who are doing everything contrary to the teaching of God's Word. And all the while, they've convinced themselves that they're in the right. Well, i got news for you, fool. Keep it to yourself. The Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 14, Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Oh my goodness. Well, pastor, you're not meaning to tell me that we're not supposed to evangelize. You're not telling me we're not supposed to be out there trying to win the lost. No, I would never tell you that because frankly, I believe... That's the primary function of the church. That's the whole reason we build buildings and we have church services and we support a preacher so he can get up and preach the gospel is so we can win the loss. You know how we used to win the loss when I was a kid? We used to invite people to church. Mm -hmm. See, we didn't do like the Jehovah's Witnesses. We didn't go door to door knocking and trying to convince people of our doctrine and trying to get them to allow us in their home so we could teach them and show them our way of belief and all. No, no, no. You know how us old time Pentecostal did it? We invited people to church. You know what happened? The Pentecostal movement for over a century has been the fastest growing movement on the face of planet earth within Christianity. Isn't it funny? It's the fastest growing movement. And yet, the Pentecostal movement has never embraced or practiced door-to-door, -door, quote unquote, evangelism. You see, if you do this thing right, If you live this thing right, people are going to be interested in what you've got. Right. See, if you wear a sign over your head and then you act like a jackal, then your good is evil spoken of. Hello now. Mm -hmm. Then you've given Christianity a bad reputation and a bad rap. But if you just live it like you're supposed to live it, and if you keep your opinions and keep your convictions to yourself, because what is a conviction for you may not be a conviction for the other guy, which is why the Apostle Paul said, listen to me, children, let every man be convinced in his own mind. Right. We got Christians in the church today. My God Almighty, if I have a certain set of convictions, everybody is supposed to have mm -hmm. my convictions. Mm -hmm. If I believe certain things a certain way, then everybody is supposed to believe it my way. There is no room for difference of opinion. There is no room for different beliefs. There is no room for people who may not be quite as mature in the Lord as you or who may not understand the Word of the Lord quite as well as you. But the whole 14th chapter of Romans is devoted by the Apostle Paul to this very issue. There is room in the church. And the church would be well served. And the kingdom of God would advance and accomplish more if you keep your religion to yourself. It's not your job to educate your neighbor how to act and how to be and what to do and what not to do. That's not your job. I remember I had a lady in my first church come to me one time. Her name was Sue, bless her heart. 
Back then, I was old-time Pentecostal holiness. I believed in the long hair of women and the dresses and long sleeves. And my God, I was as strict as any preacher could be. And bless her heart, Sue and her husband were in our church, and they embraced all the rules and all the regulations that I taught, that I practiced, preached. And one day she came to be a friend of hers. She had invited this lady to our church, and ultimately this lady came to our church and became part of our church. And uh, Sue came to me one day and she said, You know, Pastor, I just wanted to tell you and I just love the piety and the, you know, the sincere sweetness of people when they're acting all wrong. I just wanted to tell you, I feel led of the Lord to talk to June. Because June's been coming to our church now for a while. And she still puts on that eye makeup. And, and she still cuts her hair. And she still wears pants and, you know, she didn't do it in church. She never wore pants to church, just out of respect for us, you know. But at home she did. And I know some holiness preacher, some holiness person, you're going to hear what I have to say and you're going to rip off it. That's all right. You've already convinced yourself of something that I can't preach you out of, so I'm not going to worry about you. But I looked at Sue and I said, Well, honey, do you know what you ought to feel led to do? And of course, I put on that same pious smile, that same sweetness. You know what you ought to feel left to do? And she says, what? I'll never forget it as long as I'm there. She said, what? And I looked at her and I said, you should feel led to shut your mouth. Oh, if you think Pastor Charles is hard today, honey, you should have known me 40 years ago, almost, or about. You should have known me then. I don't mince words, I never have. And I said exactly that to this woman, and I meant it then, and I mean it now, and I wouldn't say it any different. I looked at her, I said, honey, let me tell you something. I'm the pastor. I look at that lady, and do you know what I see? I see a person on track. I see a person who's making advancements. I see a person who's growing in the faith. I see a person who's learning and developing at her own pace and at her own speed. I said, you leave her alone. She don't need you pushing rules and regulations on her. You live your convictions and you let her develop her own. She needs to be convinced in her own mind of these things. She don't need you to be convinced and then force your conviction upon her. Mm -hmm. I said it then. Even when I was in the holiness movement, Tommy, I had enough sense to know that the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. It's about doing right. You know what? She'll come into it. If, if she believes, if she comes to feel that, that this is the right thing to do and this is the right way to live, she'll do it. But until she's convinced, I've got people that have been in this church that I know for a fact have gotten upset with me. See, I'm going to tell you, I am the king of passive-aggressive criticism. And what I mean by that, I don't mean that I like to pass it out. I mean I can detect it in an instant. I grew up in an environment where I had people who loved to be critical and nasty, but of course they always did it in a passive aggressive way, you know. So I got news for you, honey. When somebody's trying to criticize me and somebody's trying to say something about me they don't like, but they're doing it in a way so that it kind of, sort of, doesn't quite come across as such, but that's what it is. I pick up on it like this. 
had a fellow in the church claims he grew up in the Pentecostal movement, been in this thing his whole life. Oh, he bragged about how he was just, you know, the most spiritual person and he was just full of the Holy Ghost and nobody else in the church had the Holy Ghost. And he'd say things to me sometimes that I knew. He didn't think I preached on the baptism of the Holy Ghost enough. He didn't think that I preached it into people's heads enough. That I didn't force it on them and push it on them. He didn't think that I put people under emotional uh, duress. And I didn't, you know, try to put people in an emotional state in order to kind of convince them to be baptized in Jesus' name like I should. Because after all, that's the way First Pentecostal Church down the road does it that's the way the Pentecostal movement has done it for decades nope don't do it that way I teach what I teach I preach what I preach I preach what God gives me and the rest I leave to God's timetable because I learned a long 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 time ago that if you think you're going to preach something into happening before God's time, you know, there's a reason why the Word of God said, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, there's a reason why the story of Pentecost begins with that phrase, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come. Because the Holy Ghost wasn't going to come one minute before the day of Pentecost. It didn't matter how much they thanked God for it. It didn't matter how much they pleaded for it. It didn't matter how much they prayed for it. It doesn't matter how much they tarried for it in the upper room. God's timetable said it will come on the day of Pentecost. I have a reason. I have a purpose in doing it the way I'm going to do it. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? I got news for you, honey. There's some of you watching. You haven't received the baptism of the Holy Ghost yet. Don't you worry about it. It's coming. And when it comes, you're going to find out that God had a specific reason, a specific purpose for doing it exactly when He did it, how He did it. I don't know what it is, but I'll tell you what. I've seen the Lord do it. I've told the story before. When I started my second church, Brother Gillum had retired from Riverside Church of God. My mentor, my ministerial mentor, Brother J.T. Gillum, loved the man to death, absolutely adored the man. Old-time Pentecostal holiness, but a man of tremendous wisdom, tremendous wisdom. He didn't preach clothesline. You didn't see him up in the pulpit preaching about hair, makeup, and jewelry. He lived it. And so did the majority of his church. And he told me, he said, Chuck, I'll tell you one thing, son. Best thing you can do to teach people about wholeness and living right is set the example. He said, people are going to follow the example their pastor sets. So you know what, Tommy? When I became a pastor, I didn't preach on hair, makeup, and jewelry. I just lived what I knew to live. Answered questions when they were asked. You hear what I'm telling you? And guess what? I had a hole in this church. Ask the other pastors in southern New England if I didn't have a hole in this church. I was the laughing stock of southern New England. 43 other churches in the district and the majority of them laughed at me. He thinks he's going to build a church that believes like that? <laughs> they laughed at me. They didn't laugh for long because within a year we had 100 people and we had more people and more money than 85-90% of the churches in the district. And the ladies had long hair, long skirts, the whole nine yards. But I didn't preach it. I didn't try to preach it into people's head. I lived it. I let God. I'm going to tell you, I've, I've said it before, I'll say it again. The charismatic movement came along in the 70s. And they brought this 
devilish practice of preaching people and screaming people and teaching people into a quote unquote what I call a tongues experience. In other words, they they play all these games so people would be going blah, 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 blah in the altar and then they'd stand there and say, You got it, you got it, you got the Holy Ghost. No, they didn't. You gotta let people come into this thing at their own speed. You gotta let people come in. God, let God do the lead. The problem with most Christians, even most preachers, is they don't believe God is able to do his own work. Hello now. Mm -hmm. But I had a lady, Riverside Church was being pastored by a new pastor. And we used to go visit, even though I was pastoring a new work outside of Fort Worth. We used to go back and visit Riverside, you know, on Wednesday night, because we didn't do Wednesday night. We did Tuesday night Bible study and prayer meeting. And then on Thursday night, we had an evangelistic service. We'd go back on Wednesday night. Sometimes uh, I might have opportunity to go back on other days. And I think it actually, it was before, now that I think about it, it was before I started my second church outside of Fort Worth. We were there at Riverside for church one Sunday. Now that I think about it. And there was a young lady named Crystal, kind of a stocky girl. She'd gone down to the altar and she was seeking the baptism of the Holy Ghost. She's praying for the Holy Ghost. And she kept talking about every time we'd go, she'd say, I'm asking God to fill me with the Holy Ghost, but He had not filled me yet. And the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me one day. And I turned to the girl I was going to marry, Stacy. I turned to her and I said, she's not going to get the Holy Ghost here. And Stacy said, what do you mean? I said, the Lord told me he's reserving her, Crystal, for our church. We hadn't even started our church yet. I said, he's, he is reserving her. She's going to get the Holy Ghost in our church. Well, that's kind of presumptuous. What if she gets the Holy Ghost next Sunday? What if she gets it the Sunday after that? How many weeks, how many months did it take before we started my second church? It was several weeks later. The weekend, Stacy and I got married on a Saturday. Brother Gillum, I had invited Brother Gillum to come preach for us at our little church that I'd started. It was only, at that point, a couple months old. And I invited Brother Gillum to go, well, that Sunday night, our church was small. We only had 30 or 40 people. Yeah, I said it. A couple months old, and we had 30 or 40 people. And I'm preaching hair, makeup, and jewelry, and yet I preach an affirming and positive message in the LGBT community, and we can't get enough people to come out and be supportive of it for nothing. We had our own little building. We were paying the rent. We had all the support we needed financially. No issues. Well, Brother Gillum's going to come preach for us. Well, I love Brother Gillum, and he had retired from Riverside. I wasn't going to miss him preaching. I don't care if it was the day after I got married or what. So Stacy and I were going to be in church. So we were at our little church there. Brother Gillum got up and preached and bless his heart, I'm going to tell you. When Brother Gillum retired from Riverside, it was like somebody poked his balloon and all the air come out of his balloon. That poor man, he just had no energy. He had nothing. He just fell flat, to be frank. He, he fell flat. I had never seen him preach like that in my life. I was so disappointed. I was so just sad to see it. But the Lord had spoken to me before the service. He said, somebody's going to get healed tonight and somebody's going to receive the Holy Ghost tonight. So when I went to the service that Sunday evening, I was expecting God to do some things because He'd already told me He was going to do a couple of things. He was going to heal somebody. He was going to fill somebody with the Holy Ghost. So we went to church that night and guess who happened to come to our church that Sunday night, had never been there before, so she could hear Brother Gillum preach. This little chubby girl named Crystal. 
<laughs> so she's sitting in the pew. Brother Gillum got up and preached and blessed his heart. I mean, it was, it was terrible. It was terrible. He just had no anointing, no... Honestly, his life was Riverside Church. It really was. And, you know, it, it just, it was like his life had just been pulled right out of him. Well, after he got done, I got up in the pulpit. And here it is, supposed to be the end of the service, you know. We're supposed to be kind of sewing things up and getting ready to go home. And I got up in the pulpit and I said, well, I'll tell you what. I said, I love Brother Gillum, and I'm so glad he could be with us, and you know, all the pleasantries. I said, but I'm going to tell you, I said, I don't believe God's done yet because the Spirit of the Lord told me, and I'm feeling it. I'm feeling it right now as I'm telling this story. I said, God told me he was going to heal somebody tonight, and he was going to fill somebody with the Holy Ghost. Well, all of a sudden, the Spirit of the Lord fell on that church. I kid you not. It was like God took a bucket and just poured the Holy Ghost down on that church. All of a sudden, the folks got up on their feet and they began to lift their hands up and they began to worship the Lord and we began to pray. And I looked at little Crystal. I said, Crystal, honey, I understand you've been praying for God to fill you with the Holy Ghost. She said, yes, I have. I said, well, get up here, girl. It's time. I laid my hand on her head. I said, receive ye the Holy Holy Ghost in Jesus' name. That little girl immediately whoo, threw her hands up in the air, started running around the little chubby girl, running around the sanctuary, probably in her mid to late 20s, maybe early 30s, running around the church, speaking with other tongues as the Spirit of God give her the utterance. And I mean, she just shout. All of a sudden, the church is shouting. We're dancing. We're having church all over the place. I mean, it's old time Pentecost. Brother Gillum's happy. He's getting happy. Sister Gillum's getting happy. My God, we're having church. Next thing you know, the phone at the back of the church rings. After a minute, Stacy's mother comes up and says, Pastor, uh, my mom has cancer and, you know, she, the doctors have said she's terminal. Well, they just called to say they had to take her to the hospital in an ambulance. Tonight's the night. She won't live through the night. Can we pray for them, for her? And we started praying for her. And Brother Love, one of the church members that I have, a big old chubby, big man, big, big man. He and his wife were both roly-poly. And we have these little six, seven-foot pews in our little sanctuary. Because the sanctuary wasn't but 20 feet wide or something like, you know, 24 foot wide or so. And so we had little pews on either side with a, a, an aisle on the outside and an aisle in the center. Well, brother and sister love, they used to take up the whole pew between the two of them. And brother... Love got up and he said, Pastor Mara, I feel like God has given me a direction. He said, the Lord spoke to me and said, you need to take an anointed handkerchief or, or cut a little piece of your shirt off or something and anoint it with oil and send it to the hospital and, and they need to put that on her and the Lord will deliver her and get her out of that hospital. She ain't going to die tonight. So I didn't have a handkerchief, so I pulled my shirt out of my pants and I cut with a pair of scissors a piece of the tail of my shirt off, you know. We anointed it with oil. And Brother Love said, why don't you have that little girl just got the Holy Ghost? Why don't you let her and you pray over that cloth? And so we anointed with oil and I put it in my hand and I grabbed hold of the Crystal's hand. And Crystal just started shouting. This is a girl don't know nothing about Pentecost. She come from a Baptist background. She started woo, shouting and dancing and I'm trying to hold her hand and pray over this cloth and she just shouting and dancing all over the front of the church. <laughs> Got done praying. Sent that home or to the hospital with Stacy and her mother. They put it on her mother's uh, hospital gown with a little pin, you know. They pinned it onto her. Long story short, her mother come home from the hospital that Friday. That was Sunday. Her mother come home from the hospital on Friday. She wasn't supposed to live through the night. She come home from the hospital that Friday, and she lived for years. I 
I know what the power of God looks like. I know how the Holy Ghost works. I also know you can't preach stuff into people. You've got to let God do it in His time. You follow what I'm telling you? Mm -hmm. The Lord knew what He was doing. He had He had uh, crystals, Holy Ghost baptism. He had it all lined up. It was already written in on the schedule. There's some of you folks watching this. I'm going to tell you something. One of these days, you're going to be able to come visit us having church wherever the Lord puts us. And we're going to have a church full of people. We're not going to have this foolishness that we have in Dallas. We're going to have a church full of people. We're going to have people who know how to worship God and who know how to pray and who know how to seek the face of the Lord, who want to work for the kingdom of God. And you're going to come in and we're going to be worshiping the Lord. And all of a sudden, God's going to fill you with the Holy Ghost and you're going to shout all over the place. But the Lord's reserving you for that experience, for that moment, for that time, for whatever reason. Well, I'll tell you, serving the Lord, I said it before, I'm trying to hurry, it's supposed to be a matter between the child of God and the God of the church. Our conscience, Paul said, is meant to be our guide so long as our conviction and our conscience lines up and whatever it is we feel that God is good with, whether my neighbor thinks God's good with it or not, whether the person in the pew next to me thinks God's good with it or not, it doesn't matter. What matters is that my own conscience does not condemn me. While God has given the church leadership and teachers to help ensure that we are properly instructed in the ways of the Lord, no church leader has ever been endowed with absolute authority or authoritarian rule. In Mark 10, 42 through 45, the Lord said, But Jesus called them to him and saith unto them, Ye know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and their great ones exercise authority upon them. But so shall it not be among you. But whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. And whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be servant of all. For even the Son of Man, Jesus, came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. The word of the Lord tells us in Ephesians 4, 11 through 16, And he gave some, ap uh, some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Listen, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into Him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. In 2 Timothy 4, 1-4, through 4, the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy, I charge thee therefore before God and or even the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at His appearing and His kingdom, 
Preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Got news for you, children. That's the day we live in today. Many of the preachers who are the most popular, the most well-known, the most famous, are some of the biggest false teachers and false prophets that have ever walked the face of the earth. They've convinced the church to go in directions the church should never have gone in. Listen, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 27 through 29. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. And God hath set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Listen to the question Paul asks in verse 29. Are all apostles? Are all prophets, listen, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles? More grief and turmoil has been caused in the church by members not respecting the God-appointed, God-anointed leadership and allowing them to do the job to which they are called. All are not called to teach. Mm -hmm. Did you hear what I just said? Didn't Paul just say that? He said, are all teachers? Well, the, the answer to that rhetorical question is supposed to be, well, no. <laughs> That's, that's, he was asking that question, and of course the assumed answer would be no. Are all apostles? No. Are all prophets? No. Are all teachers? Well, yeah, Paul, all their te No. The point Paul's making is, not everybody in the church is called or anointed to teach. You know what that means? That means a lot of people in the church need to shut their stinking mouths. When you got members running around the church trying to teach everybody else their understanding and their revelation and their convictions on everything, it winds up bringing confusion. More churches have been destroyed by people who don't respect the leadership. God has given apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Are all teachers? No. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. See, I told you, you're not going to hear this in a lot of fundamentalist evangelical churches. I'm almost done. I'm running a little bit long, but I'm almost done. I want to tell you, if you look back at the early church, if you look at the first century church folks, they did not have a printed Bible between a leather binding sitting on their coffee table that they could sit down and read for hours on end at every day or that they could sit down and read whenever it was convenient. No, 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 no. In the early church, half the congregations were blessed if they had a copy of one or two of the epistles that the apostles had written. Because what would happen is Paul would write his epistle to the Romans. The church at Rome then would have somebody who would sit down and they would literally copy it word for word. Punctuation for punctuation. And then they pass it along to another church in another place so they could benefit from Paul's teaching, so they could benefit from Paul's wisdom. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Churches in the first century were lucky. They were blessed if they had a single epistle available to them. So what did that mean? That meant that the people had to rely upon the leadership. Am I telling the truth? But see, now, oh, we have the Word of God in our own tongue, in our own language, and that means every believer can read it. Oh, boy, I want to tell you, one of the worst things that ever happened to the church. 
Not because every believer shouldn't have the Word of God available to them. It's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful thing that we do. The problem is most believers don't know how they're supposed to act with it. Right. Most believers think that because they can read the Bible that it's their job to run around interpreting it and teaching everybody else and showing everybody else what they understand and what they've come to believe and trying to help other people to have the same conviction, to be convinced of the same things they are. Hello now. More people have backslidden and left the church, not because of what come off the pulpit from the pastor, but because of what was pushed at him by somebody from the pew next to them. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Mm -hmm. When I tell you today, children, we're supposed to share the gospel. If you think your opinion on abortion is the gospel you're an idiot. If you think your beliefs concerning homosexuality are the gospel, you're an idiot. If you think preaching against alcohol and preaching against drugs is preaching the gospel, you're an idiot. Can I say it any clearer than this today? That is not the message of the gospel. We are called to preach the gospel. Remember I said earlier, people are going to say, Pastor, are you saying we're not supposed to evangelize? No! We're supposed to live right. We're supposed to live this thing the way the Word of God tells us to live it. If we live it right, people will come and inquire of us. And then the Word of God said we're to be ready to give them an answer. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Mm -hmm. But he didn't say go knocking on their door. He didn't say go preaching at them and telling them what they do wrong and how evil they are and how ungodly they are. Got news for you. It doesn't matter if they're a homo or a drunk, a prostitute or what they are or who they are or what sin they commit. If they're lost, they're lost. Period. Mm -hmm. So carrying on about any specific thing that you perceive as sin is stupid. Mm -hmm. this is the gospel listen 1st Corinthians I, I promise I'm trying to close it up 1st Corinthians 15 1 3, moreover brethren I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you which also ye have received and wherein ye stand by which also ye are saved if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He was seen of Cephas, meaning Peter, then of the twelve. After that He was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all he was seen of me also, as one born out of due time. So what does Paul say the gospel is? He said it is a crucified and risen Christ. Hallelujah. That is the gospel. In Romans 8, 8 through 11, Paul writes, But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. 
Acts 16, 25 through 31. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundation of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awakening out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled, or all the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in, and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. This is the gospel. Not your message against this group or against that group. Not your message of condemnation and guilt-mongering concerning this issue or that issue. This is the message of crucified and risen Christ. On the day of Pentecost, the apostle Peter answered this question. Verses uh, 37 through 39, Acts 2, my final reading this afternoon. Now when they heard this, they heard Peter preach on the day of Pentecost. They were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children, and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. This is the gospel. If the church would preach the gospel, and then live right, live righteously, live right, be prepared to answer anyone who comes to you inquiring about your relationship with God, inquiring about your salvation, inviting others to come hear the message of the cross. If the church would do this, and if believers would keep it to yourself, all your little caveats, all your personal convictions, all your personal beliefs, keep it to yourself. Paul said, you have faith, keep it to yourself. It's between you and God. All, everything that goes beyond preaching a crucified and risen Christ, everything that goes beyond preaching what one must do to be saved, Everything that goes beyond that. You are no longer preaching the gospel. You're now teaching. You're articulating. And I got news for you. For everybody out there who teaches this, there's somebody out there who's teaching that. That's right. So you say, well, but I'm convinced what I'm teaching is right. And so the other guy thinks he's right as well. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? We're supposed to live peaceably. We're not supposed to be running around arguing, debating, carrying on. If you're going to do that, then what you've got to do is learn to keep it to yourself. Keep your religion to yourself. Not the gospel. Your religion. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Oh, I'm going to tell you, church, if only we would do this thing right. We'd see revival in this country. We'd see revival sweep this world like we've never seen revival because you ain't never seen nothing happen until you do things God's way. Hallelujah. And God says, keep it to yourself. Glory to God. Would you stand with me this afternoon? Mm -hmm.